the next 10 years, what do you think will be healthcare's next major crisis? Think about it. Overpopulation? Climate change, perhaps? If you're really bold, maybe even another deadly virus spiraling our way. Now to these three options and to any that you might've thought of, I completely agree. There are a lot of issues that healthcare will be facing in the imminent future. But I challenge you to look where no one else is looking and to think outside the box. If you were to ask me that same exact question, Daniel, in the next 10 years, what do you think the next major healthcare crisis will be? I'd respond to you with medical software. And I'm confident that by the end of my talk here today, you will see with me this glaring problem that the healthcare community has consistently overlooked for years. But why medical software? To understand that, I'll tell you a little bit of a story of a couple years ago, where I was fortunate enough to be able to work at a local heart clinic. But this wasn't just any other heart clinic. This particular clinic, the moments that you walked in through those big glass doors, you could feel the aura of the warmth that was in the place. You'd look to your left and see patients almost excited to see their doctors. And then you'd look to your right and see the receptionists and the nurses and the rest of the staff giving you this almost unconditional warmth. You just knew that by the time that you entered into that clinic, you were going to get the best healthcare possible. And you just knew that these doctors were going to go that extra mile for you. Now, with regard to my work there, it sort of fit within the theme of going that extra mile, where there's this drug called empagliflozin. Now, empagliflozin started off as a type 2 diabetic drug, where it would decrease the blood sugar in heart patients. But some smart researchers found out that this particular drug, for a very specific group of cardiac patients or heart patients, it would decrease their heart-related mortality or heart-related death by almost 30%. Those are real patient lives in that 30%, but this was a relatively recent discovery, and so not all the patients had it. So my goal at this clinic was over four months of summer to go in day in, day out, and to look through hundreds of patient profiles to see who would be eligible for this, dare I say, miracle drug. And so that's what I did. For four months, every single day, day in, day out, I'd be walking into the clinic and going onto their medical software, logging in and sifting through visit reports, kidney test results, blood test results, you name it, I looked through it. And by the end of that four months, I was happy because I was putting in a lot of hard work. It was a little bit autonomous, but it was a lot of hard work. But at the end of it, there would be a real tangible gain to our patients. And so within that last week, I ended up with a list of 200 patients who would be eligible for this miracle drug. And so the doctor was very excited. He said, Daniel, that's awesome. Get to the medical software and start flagging patients so we can contact them in bulk. But what happened? I sat at the computer, I logged in, and I couldn't actually flag any patients in the system. The software didn't allow me to do that. It wasn't a feature. So I was like, okay, well, is there anything else I can do? No, there was no way for me to flag these patients or to contact them in bulk. And this was a small, busy clinic with low amounts of funding. And so given the fact that I was leaving the clinic in the next five days to go back to school, this whole project was just thrown out the window. But what does that really mean? That means that there are 200 patients right here in Vancouver who do not have a potentially life-saving drug. But why? Not because the doctors didn't care. Not because the nurses weren't amazing. Not because the staff wasn't phenomenal. But because the software didn't have a feature. As someone whose own father has had a heart attack, I know what it's like to see your family member on the hospital bed, cold and pale after a heart attack. Knowing right now that there are people in Vancouver who will undergo that same experience because of software continues to sicken me till this day. 
Now, I remember looking at those patient names and I was just concerned. I was disgusted. I don't even know how I felt at the time. It was a mix of anger, disgust, and just general curiosity about why is this even allowed? Why can we have dysfunctional software in the clinic? And so as a scientist, I tried to do what I do best, and that was to research and to find out what the problem was. And so I began with looking into what is the history of medical software. Now, for some background, medical software is commonly referred to as EMR, or Electronic Medical Record. So it turns out that after about 10 seconds of research that the first EMR was made in 1972. Now, that's back when there, there's this crazy idea of these giant cylindrical blocks called computers. No one really had them in their homes. They were bulky and inconvenient and more of a concept at the time. But this initial idea of the EMR was important. It came from a sort of curiosity where it's like, what if we integrated the digital world with our health? But again, computers weren't popular at the time, so time went on, the 80s and the 90s. And then one particular group took notice. That was the insurance company. They saw computers as a way to expedite the process of billing patients. And so that's what they did. And so insurance companies really fueled that start of the EMR. And so a lot of the big EMR companies that make this software, including the one that I was using, came from companies that used to just do insurance. And they sort of layered and layered and layered features. And that felt wrong. The basis of EMR growth didn't come from helping patients. It came from being able to bill them. But I needed some evidence. I couldn't just go out making claims about EMRs and how they are today without evidence. And so it turns out that Stanford Medical School was just as curious as I was. Back in 2018, Stanford Medical School partnered with the Harris Poll to evaluate the state of EMRs for doctors. And they started asking doctors questions. And the results that I found were distasteful. 71% of doctors say that EMRs contribute greatly to physician burnout. 54% of doctors say that EMRs take away from their career satisfaction. And almost half of doctors say that EMRs reduce their clinical effectiveness. They, they make them worse doctors because of the software. But why? I still didn't know why. I could see the end, the, the end result, the outcome, but I didn't understand what the core of the problem was. Why was this happening? And so that's what I sent on a many month quest to call and email as many doctors as I could. Now, this wasn't just within here in Vancouver, not just within the province, not even just within the country. Across North America, if a doctor had an email online, I probably emailed them. It took a long time, but we did it. And phone call after phone call, email after email, one thing became really clear to me. That no matter who the doctor was, what their background was, or what their specialty, personal interests, etc., one thing was common. One thing, and that was that doctors were spending more time trying to figure out and deal with clunky, old, outdated software instead of spending time with you, the patient. And doctors were worried that EMRs were taking away from that doctor-patient relationship. And in fact, that same Stanford study found that 60% of doctors say that medical software and EMRs need a complete uprooting, which is insane. All it's are that your doctor doesn't like their EMR and wants it to be completely changed from the system level. And that's a problem. Now, after these calls and these emails, I sat and thought to myself about what the future ought to look like. And that's where I coined the concept of EMR 2.0. EMR 2.0 is an idea that's founded in those original origins of the curiosity that led to the EMR being created in 1972. Not in the wave where the insurance companies came to try to 
little profit. Now, the first question I asked myself in creating this concept was, what does it mean to be an EMR? Very philosophical question. To the uninformed, you might say, well, it's a place to store medical data, but not quite. The EMR is a sanctuary. It's the home base of every single clinic. It's the place where your complex health history for years and years and years has been distilled into this beautiful interplay of words, letters, and numbers. But we seem to have forgotten about that. And then I asked myself, well, okay, what's the purpose of healthcare? Well, that's right here in this room, the patients. That's the goal of healthcare to improve patient lives. And so I sat down and conversation after conversation created this concept of EMR 2.0, where what if as a doctor, your EMR supported you instead of hindering you in your health? What if it enabled you to analyze your patient data in ways that you might have never thought were possible? What if maybe in the future also, integrating some level of artificial intelligence where your EMR can actually help you make life-changing clinical decisions? That is the basis of EMR 2.0, where it's not rooted in billing patients, it's rooted at the patient level. Now, you might be wondering to yourself, well, Daniel, that's a great concept and all, but is this even possible? Well, I'm glad to say that it is. I've been fortunate enough to be working with doctors out in Northern British Columbia, as well as here in Vancouver, to try to evaluate the state of a, spe a specific type of arthritis called osteoarthritis. And specifically what we're trying to do is evaluate how this disease manifests in rural indigenous patients. And what we were first started looking at were factors such as marginalization, socioeconomic status, things of that nature that have already been well reported in, in the literature. But I thought to myself, what about the role of EMRs? You gotta imagine if you're a rural patient, the nearest clinic to you might be hours and hours away. It might even be a flight away. And so with you also has to follow your data. And so you can imagine that if you are a rural patient, your data might be fragmented across a wide array of different clinics. So Dr. A and Dr. B might not know certain things about you just because of the fact that you keep on having to go between centers. And now what we've been working on is a protocol to try to streamline the data transfer process where Dr. A and Dr. B don't have to ask the patient a hundred questions every time they walk in and they won't lose critical data that they need to be able to provide the best possible care. Now that's just one way where EMR 2.0 isn't just about data storage, it's about reducing healthcare inequality. But no one ever thinks to look down that road. Now, it's important as the general public to be well endowed with knowledge about EMRs and how technology directly impacts your care in ways that you don't even know it does. Because bad software will always start as an inconvenience. If you're a doctor, it might start when your loading page takes a couple extra seconds too long. It might start when booking a patient or changing a time slot might take three clicks too many. Or it might even start where your data interface, your computer screen just doesn't look that aesthetically pleasing and you don't want to go around clicking all the buttons to learn what it does. But my final question to you is where do we draw the line between an inconvenience in healthcare and healthcare's silent killer. Thank you very much for your time.